again. We have another great show today. Great episode, great interview with Jeff Cottrell. I'll tell you all about him, but he's a superstar marketing exec. So much background, so great. Um, and a deep love of music. So we'll ask him why he chose that song because as I tell you all the time, I always ask my guests to pick the song right before we start the session so that we, um, we get kind of a sense of their personality. So we'll ask Jeff about that. But like I said, today's gonna be focusing on marketing and branding, but it will get into a lot more of that, how you get into the business, things like that. Jeff Cottrell, ladies and gentlemen, good to see you today. Where are you, where are you calling in from today? I'm calling in from the basement of my house in Atlanta, Georgia. I love it. Atlanta, great music Atlanta. town. Sorry? Great music town. Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. And we'll yeah. talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So uh, first, I'm going to get into Jeff's bio, and then we'll talk about his career a little bit. But Jeff and I go way back, like <laughs> way, way back. And uh, back to the late 80s or late 90s, actually, we were negotiating a major marketing partnership when I was at Universal Studios. Jeff was at Coca-Cola. You know, he was this he was the senior elevated guy. I was this minion at Universal Studios, but somehow I got to sit at the same table to negotiate a deal with him. And this was a deal that was several hundred million dollar um, marketing transaction that was featured in the Wall Street Journal actually, which was really, really cool. But this is where I met this, this young man. And the cool thing about it is that, first of all, I met this great guy. Secondly, there are a couple of lessons here, the power of relationships that we keep talking about, because here we are over 20 years later, and Jeff is giving his time for Creative University. There's that. Um, it shows you the power of relationships. It also shows you that deals don't have to be adversarial. You know, they don't have to be. The best deals sometimes can be when people come together and they, they work constructively, constructively together. And... One of my favorite moments in my career was after we closed this several hundred million dollar deal. And at least my recollection was that we went to this diner. Jeff was good enough to take us to this diner in Atlanta, like late night. I recall something like two in the morning or something like that. It was. And we're drinking beers to celebrate because diners had alcohol there. God bless them. Uh, and we go to the jukebox and I have this memory of listening to In the Air Tonight with Phil Collins. And it was just one of those moments, one of those career moments. And uh, that was with this guy. That was a lot of fun. That was a great experience. You were, you were a tough negotiator, but it was fun <laughs> that we got through that together. Yeah. So uh, we're, listen, it's great to see you. We're going to talk about brands today. And for that reason, just to show you, I'm fully, I'm, I can barely see myself, but I'm wearing this hat today with one of my favorite um, philanthropic organizations called CORE, which is Community Organized Relief Effort. They're the ones who are doing all the massive vaccinations at Dodger Stadium. It's Sean Penn's relief organization that started with a major earthquake several years ago. I had the, I had the co-founder and, co and CEO, Ann Lee, who is a guest about three months ago on Creative University. Amazing organization, check it out. Yeah. Good. Here I have my favorite um, uh, film production company, A24, make amazing films. My family and I love it, they're my co-founders. Um, I'm wearing my Nike sweats, but as an homage to you, Jeff. <laughs> nice. I'm wearing nice. my, and by the way, Converse, and we'll talk about it there. My, Very nice. My, my Chuck Taylors and, I never do that, but I figured why not. Okay, so here's a quick bio on Jeff. Jeff is founding part, he's a founding partner of Marvin Magazine and Media, which focuses on storytelling centered around today's emerging, emerging voices in fashion, art, and music. The company also produces original content for major brands like Porsche. He, he previously served as the head of marketing at Coca-Cola in North America, which is pretty cool where he led all the advertising, media, digital, social media, experiential, regional marketing, sports and entertainment properties, and college and university relationships, which is obviously relevant here. Um, but that's not all. He also served as GM and CMO, which is Chief Marketing Officer of Converse, which is part of Nike Inc., which by the way, I didn't even know that. I had mm -hmm. no idea that Converse was part of Nike. Yeah. 
And at Converse, he launched various artist-friendly platforms, including Converse Rubber Tracks and their three artists, one song platform. Again, you see music being a substantial part of his background. And in that regard, he served as chairman of the board for the Grammy Foundation, which is pretty amazing, and has won several of the, of the industry's major awards, including the Brand Week's Marketer of the Year. So, you know, I'm, I'm honored, man, I'm honored. And then one more thing, and then we'll get into it. He's also served on the board of, Center, board of the Center for Consumer Insights at Yale and has been a keynote featured speaker <clears throat> at Harvard Business School, Northwestern, Boston College, Babson, and a lot of other places. And Jeff's also just a philanthropic guy. So great stuff, man. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. It's been a fun, I've had a fun ride. I've been okay. very, very lucky, very fortunate to have um, the opportunities that I've had and I've enjoyed, you know, virtually every single one of them yeah well, <laughs> well we'll talk about we'll talk about the virtually the one that maybe didn't because that's yeah. an important thing for people to yeah hear for too. sure so first of all we got to hear the story of why you chose the song where it's at by beck oh beck is one of my just beck is one of my favorite artists of all time and it's just because the guy continues to surprise and reinvent and disrupt his own career um, and I've always loved that song. And every time I hear that song, I think, man, wherever this place is, I want to be there right now. And it just, um, it was always my walk up music for presentations for my last couple of jobs. I always played it and I'd always walk up on stage because it just makes me feel like I was just, I had the camera turned off and I was jamming to the song. So thank you for playing it. <laughs> Two turntables and a microphone. Exactly. That's all you need. It, yeah. Totally. Or three chords in the truth. One, right. one of the two. Yeah. So by the way, I didn't say this to everybody out there. Um, please send your, feel free to send your questions. In fact, send your questions via chat or through the Q and A function in your Zoom so that we, I'm gonna save time at the end. I have several questions already. We'll get to those because that's, we wanna get you the content that you want, of course. But, so let's start before we get into, you know, the, the main topic that you want to talk about which is marketing branding. Like where is the consumer guys? brands and marketers, how about the consumer? Think of them first. Give us, um, like, how did you get into your illustrious career? How did it all start? Uh, you know, it's funny. Um, luck, 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 and a positive, tried to have a positive attitude and sort of lean forward. But I graduated from college and I got recruited for uh, a sales role at Procter & Gamble. And I went to Florida State and getting a job with Procter & Gamble out of Florida State was a really big deal. And yeah. you know, I was like, okay, cool, well, let's do this. So I did that. And I spent 11 years at P&G. I started in sales. I moved into brand marketing. I was in Cincinnati. I lived in Charlotte, North Carolina. I lived in Atlanta. I lived in Gainesville, Florida, and Cincinnati over those 11 years. And um, super fun, taught me the basics of marketing, blocking and tackling. I left there and I went to work at Coke for the first time. I had two, two tours of duty at Coke. And How did that happen? Um, my first boss at P&G left P&G at one point and went to Coke. And he called me and said, hey, um, there's this really interesting sports marketing role um, leading all of motorsports and you know NASCAR, IndyCar, all that kind of stuff. And I think you'd be good for it. You should come down and check it out. <clears throat> and my wife was seven months pregnant. So I flew to Atlanta from Cincinnati um, and, uh, and got the job. So we, we decided to leave P&G, come to Atlanta. And I did that for nine years and it started in sports. And then I kind of drifted into, um, I've always had this passion for entertainment and music and no one at the company was doing anything with music. So I just started like side hustling at work, meeting people in record labels, getting to know artists, getting to know managers. And all of a sudden I was like, I had another job, but I was doing another job as well. You're and a hustler. Yeah, no, it, it was just fun. Like no one was doing it. And I thought, well, heck, I work for Coke. Like people will take meetings for, from you if you work for a place like Coke. So I took advantage of it and got to know a lot of people. And then, um, so I was there for almost nine years. And then I left. Let, let, let me yeah. stop you a yeah. couple things. Sure. So first of all, it, it shows, um, the, again, the power relationships, which is a central theme because you made it, in, you were in P&G and it was your first boss, but he remembered, or he or she remembered you, and yeah. 
and and so something unexpected came on down the line. So it's not like you had a you had a plan to go to Coca Cola at all. Right. But and so again, everybody who's out there, we talk about this a lot. It's so key to when you're in some place to maintain, establish, maintain, foster those relationships, make it a you know authentic two way street, and um, and then work really really hard. I mean that's totally. like that's one lesson. And then another thing you said when you were talking about Coke, which is really interesting, is that you were, you were responsible for one area, mm -hmm. but you, you, know, you were a hustler in a, in a positive way. Like you were, you were a guy who was um, entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. innovative, and so you made things happen. You created opportunities that weren't like in your job description. And I think that's a really important lesson for everybody out there too, is that you, you may get a certain position, but it doesn't define what your career will be. Right. That's exactly right. You, you, that's exactly right. And I've never really let a role define my career. I've always tried to define what it is I do along the way. So, so the guy that brought me to Coke was my first boss. He was also in my wedding. So I was, he, he's a very dear friend of mine. We, we maintained a very good friendship. And from the minute I started working for him. Um, and then after about uh, eight and a half, eight years, something like that, I was at Coke. I, when I was a little kid, I wanted to, my dream was to run a record label. And I, it's a super weird, when I think back on it now, like it seemed completely normal to me when I was 13 and 14 years old, but it like, all make it, it all makes sense now. It was a master plan. And, <laughs> but it never occurred to me to play guitar, to join a band. Like I was always just interested in the, the business of music. It was super weird. I used to sell Cokes when I was 13 years old, I would sell fountain Cokes at Tampa stadium so I could go see rock concerts for free. It was the only way my parents would let me see concerts as a you know 13 year old kid in Tampa. Yeah, yeah. Floyd, Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, like, you know, so I had this deep love for music. So I got a call from someone else that I knew that was at Starbucks that asked me to come and run the business of the record label that Starbucks used to have. We used to have yeah. a record label called Hear Music. Uh, so I packed up the family and moved to Seattle and worked for Starbucks for three years. And it was a I learned so much from people like Howard Schultz, like the guy's just the, the most inspirational person, one of the most inspirational people I've ever met. We got to, we signed direct record deals with Paul McCartney and James Taylor and um, Joni Mitchell. Um, it was super, super fun. But, you know, Seattle was tough for a Florida yeah. boy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I don't drink coffee, <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of tough. Yeah, but I, had a, but I had a great time. So I, I did that for, for three years. And then I got a call from a recruiter that I didn't know that, um, that asked me about the role at Converse. Um, and I was sitting in my office in Seattle. I was wearing a pair of Chucks. And I, I was like, oh, my gosh, my whole life makes sense now. I, yes, this is the job for me. And, this, and I was like, I, and I never say things like this, but I was like, I, I, I promise you. That if they meet me, they'll hire me because I am perfect for that job. I, I, I I'm, I'm, I'm telling you. And the, and the woman on the line was like, "Whoa, buddy, slow down." I just <laughs> and I don't, to... and I don't drink coffee. <laughs> right. And I just wanted to see if you were interested. And I'm like, I'm beyond interested, but I'm telling you, once I meet them and they meet me, it's going to be a match made in heaven. I promise you. By the way, it's kind of meant to be po when poetic that you're wearing your chucks, which are yeah. your Converse sneakers. Totally. Totally. I grew up wearing them. So it was, so I went and did that for about nine years and we grew the business from about $350 million to almost $3 billion in about nine years, massive growth, repositioned the brand, flipped our business model. That had a lot to do with our revenue shift, but it was really fun. And we did things the opposite way of how I'd been taught to do things at places like P&G and Coke. I would literally say to myself, huh, what would Coke do? Huh? I'm gonna do the opposite. <laughs> well, because we didn't have any money. Okay, okay. George Costanza. <laughs> totally. That was what we did. That was our strategy. So, how did you change the business model? Um, it was a licensee model at first, and then we went and bought bought some markets back. We bought China back. We brought the UK back. I see. Um, the rest of Western Europe. So there was some some revenue expansion in that business model. I see. But we went from selling six million pairs of sneakers a year to about 105 million pairs a year. So we, I mean, we increased the business significantly. We took a brand that was, you know, a hundred years old and old 
and refreshed it, repositioned it around creativity, around music and art, fashion, and, and we had a lot of fun. So, so I, I, I did that for a while and then I went and ran an advertising agency for a year, which was interesting. Um, I always kind of thought, oh yeah, I want to do that. So I did that for a year and it was the wrong, it was the wrong agency in the wrong place for me, but I met wonderful people and I learned more than I could have ever imagined about how to be a better marketer. So, um, I did that. Then I took, I literally took a year off work and went fishing and hung out with my kids. And then, um, I went awesome. back, and then I went back to Coke because my friend called me again and he had just been named president and said, Hey, like, can you come help us with our marketing? And I was like, sure. So, so I came back and, and did a second tour at Coke and I was there for just short of about three years. And I'm, you yeah. know, had a, had a really, really great time. And then, then I just decided to move on and do some other stuff. And so you started your own place now, your own firm. Yeah. One of many things that I'm doing, I decided to not, I don't want to go back to corporate. I mean, it's 30 plus years in corporate America. I've been extremely yeah. successful, super uh, grateful for all the opportunities, but I don't want to go through that grind again. So yeah. some, a couple of friends of mine called me up and asked me if I wanted to help start this magazine, this content platform. I was like, yeah, I don't know anything about a magazine. Sure. Let's do that. So we did, we yeah. launched it. And then I'm consulting for a bunch of startups. And then I'm also about to announce that I'm about to become the president of a, of another really small boutique, super, super cool LA based um, agency that I'm going to work from Atlanta to, to, to lead. It'll be good, cool. for, you. good for you. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thanks. Congratulations. Thanks. You're the first. By the way, oh. Look, it's fun to, it's fun to be involved in a lot of different things for sure. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I totally get that. Okay. So, um, one one thing about P&G, because all you marketers and brand people, at least back in the day, everybody used to always say that P&G, Procter & Gamble, was the training ground for marketers. Like yeah. that was the, like where you got your best practices. Do you yeah. feel that that is still the same today? Uh, well, it's hard for me to say because I'm not there, but I mean, it certainly is a great place that is grounded in the fundamentals of marketing. Um, in consumer data and consumer research, consumer understanding, they're, they're a, a great company. Um, I left there because at the time in the you know mid '90s, it was uh, hard to be hard to have a creative brain there because they were so structured and this is the way we do things. And yeah. you would, you would raise your hand in a meeting and say, "Oh my gosh, I have an idea," and they would say, "Jeff, your initiative is amazing. We love that, <laughs> but we don't do it that way." And you're like, "Oh, okay." And then you would do it over and over again, and then you would get shut down every time. So, so I finally got to a place where I, when I had an idea, I would go up and I just wouldn't do, I wouldn't say anything. And yeah. I was like, this is not where I want to be anymore. So that's, that's why I left. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and again, I, I think that there are a few other lessons there just about some of the, you know, you were at a number of places for many, many years, actually. Mm -hmm. And yep. then you had a couple stints that were in between, including a year off too. And it's just like, there's no one right, one right way to do a career. Like, you, you know, there, there isn't. And certainly if you plan, like it's going to go one way, it's going to go many other ways too. And you got to be, you know, especially now open and entrepreneurial about how you approach things. No question. So let's go into the main event. Um, <laughs> Marketing and branding, like you, I asked you, what what do you think would be helpful to people out there? And again, send your questions in, guys, and we'll get to those. And you're you're you were telling me that frequently the consumer is the brand puts the brand first, or the marketer puts the marketer first, instead of the consumer. So what yeah. do you mean? What do you mean by that? And help everybody understand that. So what what I mean by that is, um, you know, you're in a business, you make a product and you want to sell your product and you want to sell it to people. And it's funny how many companies just think about, I made a product and I want to sell it. And they don't actually think about the people. And I've always had the philosophy that the people should come first, that, that the consumer should be everything. The consumer should be the people that you serve, the people that you create experiences for, products for, services for, but that you should have a service mindset. But that's not the way it works in, in corporate America. We get to work and we have this assumption that our brand is really important. We are important. Like, and we, we sit in conference rooms and we talk to ourselves all day long in meetings of 10 people about how amazing we are and about how important 
our brand is to the to the world. And we actually sit there and we believe it. And we and then when we do things in the marketplace and they don't work, we are puzzled. Why? I mean, we are so great. Why didn't that work? And it's because oftentimes we don't really think about the consumer and about serving them. So oftentimes in meetings, I would leave an empty chair next to me. And at the end of the meeting, I would say, hey, can we just stop for just one minute? I'd like to ask a question. So let's imagine that one of our consumers was sitting in this chair right next to me. And she heard everything we said in the last hour. She heard how we talked to each other. She heard, actually, she didn't hear anything about her. We didn't even, we didn't even talk or we didn't even acknowledge her. So do you think if she was sitting in here and she saw this meeting that she would ever buy anything from us again? And the answer is no, she wouldn't. So we need to start behaving as if the consumer is with us. We are the representative in the corporation. Marketers are the representative of the consumer. And we are the ones that are supposed to stand up and speak on their behalf. Mm -hmm. And I think so many marketers are focused on doing things to their consumers and not thinking about the context of their consumers' lives. And I've seen it over and over and over and over and over again in, in, in the brands that, you know, that, you know, people I know that work at brands, brands I've worked on. And it's, it's, it's really, it's really sad, you know, and if you, a, a quick story, if you, you know, we're supposed to take 10,000 steps a day. So if you walk in your office in the morning and you scan your badge and you think I'm super important, everyone cares about my brand, you're going to carry that with you everywhere you go. But if you come into the office in the morning and you scan your badge and you think, man, I got to earn it today. I really need to understand what the consumer needs and wants from us. You take 10,000 steps, you're going to wind up in a very different place. You're going to wind up in a different room with different people. And the, the key with a big corporation is to make sure that those rooms are not so far apart that we miss the opportunity to serve, surprise, delight people that we're selling things to. That's awesome. I, I love that. Marketers are the representatives of the, of the people. Of your yeah, sure. of your customers. Yeah, right. I love that. I think that. So I mean, if, if a million, you know, you think if you're a marketer, and I used to say this, but if a million people showed up at your front door, a million consumers, and let's assume they're not mad, they're not angry, there's no protest, but, but a million people that you know love your brand show up to your office, and you're up in the 15th floor, and you're looking out the window, and you're like, well, that's a lot of people down there, and you notice that somebody's going. So, so you look at your friends in the room, you're like, oh my God, they want, they want us to come down. And then we quickly look at each other like, who the heck's going to go? You go, you're going. And you go, oh, okay. And then you get in the elevator and you're like, oh my God, what am I going to say? Oh, there's a million people out there and they want me to come downstairs and they want, I don't, what am I going to say? And if I play it out, like most marketers play things out, I'd grab a giant screen and I'd show them an ad, you know, but I think if given that situation, I come downstairs, I stand up and I open with, thank you. Ah, uh, thank you for drop the mic. Well, I mean, look at this building that I work in. Look at this beautiful place that I get to work in. I come here every day. You guys paid for this. I, I went on vacation with my family for spring break. And you know what? You guys paid for it. You bought our stuff. And like, I got that as a result of you buying our stuff. So thank you. And then I would say, what can I do for you? What can, can I get you something? Can I get you a drink? Can I get you this? Um, and that's the mindset that we need as marketers. If we really want to connect, and I would argue deeply connecting with people builds your business significantly for a long time. Yeah. It might take a little longer to do it, but you'll have more loyal consumers longer than a lot of consumers for a very short period of time. So yeah. Um, yeah, so that's my kind of like my philosophy in all these years of marketing. It's like, it just hit me one day, like what the heck, man? We don't, we don't even care. We say we do. And we make sappy commercials in the Super Bowl and we like wrap ourselves in the flag and all that kind of like, but we, do we really care? Like, that's the question. Do you really know me? As a consumer, you know, brands are telling me it's going to be okay. You're going to, we're going to make it through this pandemic together. We know how you feel. And I'm like, you're, 
you're a car. You don't know how I feel. <laughs> well, okay. So creating that emotional attachment, absolutely. Because then it's not just a transaction. It's something, it's, it's almost like a commitment from the consumer. A, a, it's a mutual relationship, right? Mutually yeah, beneficial. Sure. So who is doing that right then? Well, let, and, and then I'll, I'll ask, well, I'll ask that. And then I'm going to take you up on the, if you're a car company, what would you do? So let's start with who's doing it right first. Um, it might seem like an obvious choice, but I, I think the best brand in the world right now is Nike. Hmm. I, and I'll tell you why. Um, Nike, first of all, is obsessed with making really good products. So that, you know, the average Nike sneaker or apparel is really well built. Uh, it's been considered, it's been well designed. But, you know, they stand for the athlete. And if you think back to, you know, the Colin Kaepernick situation where, the, you know, you had these owners in the NFL saying, my players are not going to do this. And, you know, and you had Nike kind of like, I'm an official sponsor of the NFL, but I also like have a lot of players that wear my shoes. And Nike picked a side. Yeah. They said, we're with the athlete. We're with the athlete. And that's a risk in today's world when a lot of brands want to play it down the middle and not make anybody mad. Nike said, no, 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 sorry. Sorry, NFL. It's about these people. And these people have something to say and we're going to support them and we're going to give them a platform. Let, me, they, ask you, can, let, me, ask you, let me ask you a quick question about that. Sure. In the, I know you don't know. Well, maybe you do. But in the executive ranks, when that happened with Colin Kaepernick, do you think that that was an easy answer for them? Like they, as executives, it was so in their DNA that they, yeah? I, I, I believe that because I believe having worked at Nike for nine years as a, you know, Converse as, as a subsidiary, having seen them firsthand and learned from them firsthand about how important the athlete is to them. Um, I think that honestly, they had no choice really and they knew it and they might have taken a beat to just sort of go okay let's make sure we do this the right way but you know they come out with a bold colin kaepernick statement uh with an, with their advertising and they continue to you know every three to six months they continue to kind of drop something in the marketplace that that challenges the status quo and pushes us forward so i i i just love that brand i just i love what they how confident they are about who they are and what they support and why they exist. And um, I think had they chosen to side with the NFL, which I don't think would have ever happened, but had that have happened, I think they would have taken a massive hit to their brand and what they stand for. And people would have been like, oh gosh, I don't actually know you. I thought yeah. I knew you, but I, I, I don't. So I applaud, I really I applaud that company for, for what they've done. Uh, who else do you think is doing uh, one more example of who's doing it right? Doesn't need to be a big guy. Um, you know, some, but is there any, anyone else who you just, uh, think, they, no one comes to mind right off the top of my head. Well, how do you feel about, uh, I'm just curious how you feel about Amazon as a brand because oh, it's just man. everywhere in our lives. Yeah. So, and they, by the way, middle, right? and the reason why I ask you that question is because they always say, that they put the customer first. I yeah. like that's their fundamental mantra that they say to the press. Is that authentic? What do you think? I mean, they've done an amazing job of being able to bring costs down, prices down for consumers and make it easy to shop. Um, I think they have become so incredibly big and powerful and they've collected data. They have more data on us than maybe we're comfortable with. Yeah. Um, I mean, they, they, but, but I mean, they were a massive disruptor in the marketplace. They started selling books, like mailing books to people and, you know, then made the leap to now ever, everything. So, you know, <laughs> I don't own any Amazon stock. I probably should, but I don't, but um, yeah, that's a tough one because they're on one hand, they're the evil empire, but on the other hand, like, you know, the prices have come down for consumers, small businesses have been, some have been hurt. Yeah, because they get sucked up into, oh, gosh, I can sell on Amazon and then they do. And then the prices get driven down and then their profit margins get squeezed. But it's, you know, it's a new it's a it's a new marketplace that I think, um, you know, provides people with opportunity.
And um, yeah, I don't think too much about the brand though. Mm -hmm. I think about them as a service, but I don't think that the brand stands yeah. for anything. Like Nike stands for, you know, the human spirit and the athlete and like, you know, striving for, and Amazon's just like, it's just a button I push to get some paper towels. <laughs> Amazon's just everywhere. Your helper for everything. Yeah, right. They're right, but I don't know that 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 doesn't res that that's not what I take away. I I hear you. I, yeah. I totally get that. So yeah. there's so much to talk about. So little time on this, but in this multi-platform media world of ours, and you know, it's something that like we're also focused on. I think a lot of the traditional brand companies are struggling with how to understand how to engage to like students, college students, high school students, you know, young people, um, Gen yeah. Y and Z. When you look at the 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 campaigns that you see out there, what do, do you have a couple examples of something that's blown your mind as being a really innovative marketing or advertising campaign? Oh man, that's a good question. I can tell you, I can give you a couple of examples of things I, I think aren't. Okay. Um, and then maybe we can get to examples that are. I, I think um, during the pandemic, when the pandemic first started, and I wrote about this in Fast Company last week, that, that companies and brands pulled their advertising off the air because they wanted to be sensitive and they didn't want to say the wrong thing. They also did it to save marketing dollars to put to the bottom line, but that's a different, that's a whole different session. Um, but then they started to come back out and say things. And it was all about this sort of fake empathy. Like, we, we know how you feel. We're, we're, we're here for you. This is a horrible time. But we're going to offer you 0% financing on a brand new truck. <laughs> yeah. Or we're going to offer Lincoln. Lincoln offered a touchless delivery. This beautiful shot, this beautiful modern house with this person in the kitchen. And the person pulls up in the Lincoln. And it's a touchless delivery. And I'm like, People are dying everywhere. And you're offering me a touchless delivery. Like I'm buying in, an SUV. In front, not, of a, in front of a mansion. Yeah, right. And the, uh, buying an SUV is not actually like, if you want to say you understand me, then just say that and show me. But then don't end it with the last 15 seconds where you're trying to give me like 0% financing. Like you're going to do me a big favor in the midst of this, this pandemic. So um, I think there were so many brands that like attempted to do that. And when you step back and looked at all the ads, they were basically all exactly the same montage of romantic pictures and beautiful music and the same message at the end. And I think that they all felt kind of flat um, because the authenticity and the realness wasn't, um, just wasn't there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Uh, yeah. So there's been like, it, it, do you have an example of somebody who really got it right? It doesn't have to be during the campaign um, or during the pandemic, but is there anything that's just like, maybe, I mean, think about that one. Yeah, let me think about that one. I got to ask you about the, an obvious brand that I didn't mention. How do you feel about Apple as a brand and also what they've done through the pandemic and also through all the political crises that we've seen? Uh, I mean, I, I, you know, it's hard to it's hard. I mean, some people love to bash Apple and say, oh, yeah, you know, but I'm literally in the process of setting up my new iPhone 12 Pro Max. Like it's literally right next to me transferring data as we speak. So I'm a big fan of the brand. The brand is product centric, right? Great companies make great products, not just great commercials. They make great products and they still to this day obsess about the details of their other products and they're now they become ubiquitous you know they used to be you know niche and now they're ubiquitous so i think it's interesting how they've dealt with their ubiquity yeah but um they continue to come with with products that you know amaze people and you, they're you kind know, of like they're kind of like nike in terms of an emotional no attachment question. right no question, no question. Okay. probably okay. better probably better uh from an emotional connection than than even nike yeah um because you know you who go you don't go anywhere without your phone anymore. Like no, I mean you know I I I leave my home some days on purpose and like all day I'm like oh god I wonder what I'm missing and I'm like what has happened to me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and think about like uh, it was not obvious for Apple many years ago now to get into the retail game. You know right. to have be in your local shopping mall or wherever and build these beautiful 
um, uh, temples to their products, right? And to their customers. And that's marketing. That was really a marketing rather than trying to sell as much of it. That was just a temple of Apple that we came to worship in. So, and the brand seized us not only online and in our products, but it was kind of everywhere we go. I mean, one thing that uh, you see that happening, and again, it doesn't have the emotional attachment, but you see Amazon going out of the home into retail too, in yeah. so many different ways. So they're always with you and always communicating with you. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's funny, I learned that at Starbucks. You know, I when I first got to Starbucks, I, I had the opportunity to go to some Starbucks stores with Howard Schultz, the founder. Yeah. And I asked him a question, like the third store, we, we went to like eight stores one day. And I said, hey, Howard, and at the time, Starbucks didn't advertise. So I said, Howard, why, why don't we advertise? And he looked at me and said, what? And me being from the South, I said the same thing, only I said it slower. <laughs> why don't we advertise? And it was a moment of very awkward silence. And he said, I want you to look around. And I'm like, okay. He goes, no, I really want you to look around. I want you to really look at what's happening here. He said, you see the woman who's third in line? I'm like, yeah. He said, did you see what happened when she walked in? I said, no. He said, that's because you weren't looking. I want you to watch what's about to happen. And this was before you could order on your phone or any of that stuff. And the woman got to the counter and the barista handed her her coffee. And he said, you see that? That woman comes in here every single morning and that barista knows her and that barista knows what she drinks. And that barista made her coffee before she got to the counter. That, my friend, is more powerful than any advertising. Oh, yeah. This is our marketing, our stores, our experience. And Apple, I think, learned that from people like Starbucks. Because um, we worked closely with Apple when I was at Starbucks, but, but you know, obsessing about the experience because that's really what it is. You know, some retailers make it hard for me to shop there because it's about them. Yeah. But people like Apple make it easy for me to shop there. Like there's too many people in the store because it's so crowded, but like the products are elevated. They're out. I can touch them. I can test them. Someone walks up to me. I can buy it right there. I don't have to wait in line. And then I'm out the door. So it, it's, it, yeah, experience still matters and retail still matters. Was there another awkward so silence when you were with Howard and you did not go up to the counter to order a coffee? No, I, I drank coffee while I was there. Oh, you did. Okay. Yeah, he did. He did catch me uh, pouring a Diet Coke into a Starbucks <laughs> coffee mug one day and never let me forget it. Oh, I bet. You got to know your product, right? Yeah. Okay. So we don't have, I want to get into the questions, but let's get, um, Right now, for, for these young people who are out there um, and they're thinking, you know, they're, a lot of them are in school obviously now, but most of them are virtual. Yeah. A lot of people have taken semesters off because it was such a virtual experience, but yet there's really not, it's hard to get internships, it's hard to get jobs, it's hard to do so many things, don't yeah. even know what to do. Right. Understandably, by the way, understandably. Sure. No question. So what, what do you think, like, what kind of advice can you give young um, people who want to get into the world of marketing, branding, advertising, all of that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think first and foremost, you know, I, you know, I think to enter any profession, you should have an incredible amount of curiosity to learn about the profession. So coming in with passion and curiosity to like really understand what the hell's going on is super important, first and foremost. If you don't have that, like it doesn't matter who you know and how you get the interview, you won't get the job. Um, but second and the most important thing is to network. Is to Networking is the most important thing you need to learn how to do in your career. Every single job I have ever had in my entire career has come through networking. It's come from, I know somebody who knows somebody who got me to meet somebody. And, you know, I learned this a long time ago from a man named Don Keogh that used to be the president of, of Coca-Cola. And he said, um, you know, someone, one success in life is directly related to their willingness and their ability to ask for help. Huh. And so many of us are, are afraid to ask for help because we think it's a sign of weakness. When in fact, it's a sign of great strength when you okay. ask somebody to help you and you'd be surprised how many people will. Okay. I'm going to reach out to you on a continuous basis now. And that's right. Yeah. But that's, that's the, that's the thing yeah. is that you'd be surprised when you ask somebody that you think, God, they'll never help me. Yeah. 
how many people, and some won't stop and help you, but how many people will? Yeah. Because at that moment, you remember, oh my gosh, someone helped me. I'm here well, and, because and someone helped also me. Is, and they will definitely help you, or they will, most people will help you if they have felt you've been authentic with them in the past. Yeah. And that it's not just an outreach because, like, if you're introduced by somebody who you have an authentic relationship and you don't know the person, who they've introduced you, that's okay because that one person goes to bat for you and says, this person's a good guy, like, exactly. you know, a good guy. But exactly. that's such an important part of it is that, again, relationships are, are two-way streets and it, you can't just ask, you gotta give. It's yep. so critical to give. But I love the fact that, you know, show your vulnerability. Troy Carter in my last session was talking about that too. He was talking, like he went really, it was wonderful to see this music icon talk yeah. about how he was, he fell like completely his career, not that long ago, in like 2008. I know, I know. Wife and kids, and he didn't know what he was going to do. And then yeah, he just kind of made things happen because somebody introduced Lady Gaga to him. And that's yeah. how it all started. Yeah. So it's pretty wild. It's such a great guy. Such a, He's one of the great guys, truly great guys in music. I've worked yeah. with him. He's, he's, he's a great guy. You guys should watch that interview. It's really cool. I want to talk to you about that. The inter when you were talking about, um, you, know, you when you were you you told the executive recruiter for Converse that if they meet me, I'll be hired. Yeah, essentially. So okay. weird. So give us some advice to everybody out there about how to approach interviews. Yeah. Um, again, um, so I I can't stress this enough. Curiosity. If, if I, you would be surprised, as someone who sat in the chairs that I've sat in and interviewed the number of people that I've interviewed. What I normally tell people when they get to my office is, I'm not going to talk to you about your technical skills because I figure you have pretty good ones or you wouldn't have gotten to my office, right? Because you've been interviewed by other people along the way. I'm going to get to know you. And I want to know what you want to know. And I they're quickly fumble for your list of questions and ask me a question and I'll answer it. And then there's that split second that if you don't ask me a follow-up question or kind of acknowledge that like what you've just heard and maybe dig a little deeper, I won't hire you. Yeah. I literally, that's what I, I look for the follow-up question. I look for the, oh gosh, that's interesting that you said that. Well, what about this? Oh, right on. Got, I've got that mindset that I know I can teach, that I know I can guide, that I know I can lead and help, and that I know that someday I'll be working for. Um, but if you don't have that spark of curiosity and you're like, oh, okay, that's, a, thank you. And then you just sort of, uh, my next question is, yeah, you know, and that's what happens. Cause that's, you're kind of like, it's an awkward moment, but like be, show vulnerability, ask the question, be curious, do your homework on the company and do your homework on the person. Cause like, it's super easy to research people now. Like it's yeah. not hard. Um, Cause we all have our digital footprint, good and bad. And but, you know, know who you're talking to and, you know, make it personal, but be authentic and be yourself. Be curious. Um, that is, to me, the, the number one thing that, that I look for when I hire somebody. Curiosity, period. Yeah, well, my, my wife, Louisa, who's a co-founder of Creative University with my two kids, Hunter and Luca, um, she, she's, her fundamental piece of advice is related to that. And I think it's dead on. It's yeah. a good interview when they did a lot of the, the interviewer did a lot of the talking. Yeah, that's right. And so don't feel that you need to be the one who's doing all the talking. That's not the right rhythm. It's a conversation. Yeah, I think if you walk out of an interview and you think you did all the talking, that you probably, probably wasn't a great interview. You yeah. might feel good about what you said, but but you want the other person to be talking. And then don't ever forget that, and it's easy to do this, and it's, this is easy for me to say now. And it's hard, to, it's hard to do when you're young, and I get this. But like, you're interviewing them too. You're making a decision about where you're going to spend your time and what you're going to focus on. So make sure that you interview them as well that your questions are, let me help me, what's your leadership style like, right? Because you could be like so desperate to get the job that you get hired and you find out that you're working for Attila the Hun, like somebody who's just crazy, mean, obnoxious, and you're like, oh my God, I'm miserable. 
And like, that's on you for not like interviewing the company as well. I, I just recently had a recruiter call me about being a, a CEO of a company that has been around for about eight years and like two founders, they're young, they're really great. They're kind of stuck and they need somebody that's kind of been through the rodeo before. I met the first founder was like really nice. The recruiter said, what'd you think? I'm like, nice. I don't know if it's right for me. Oh, we'll meet the second one. Oh, cool. I met the second founder. I was like, wow, you're amazing. This is great. I don't really think I want to do this job. And I called the recruiter afterwards. I go, you know what? I'm not interested. And he's like, what do you mean you're not interested? Like, why, why didn't you tell me that before you met him? And I was like, well, because I didn't know before yeah. I met him that I wasn't interested, but I interviewed them and like, I don't want to work there. Yeah. And um, so, you know, think about that because it's, you know, it's something you're going to do every single day. You're going to go to work every single day. And if you're miserable, like part of it can be on the leader, but part of it can be your fault as well. Yeah. So like always look for that thing that, you know, it's easy for me also for us to say at this stage, oh, look for what makes you happy. Happy is not a destination. Ha happy is every day. Happy, oh. is, happy is a choice. Happy is a choice you make every single day. It's not like, you start and I'm miserable and someday I'm going to be happy. Like that's, it's not, that's not the, the end of the rainbow is not happiness. The end of the rainbow is like the end. <laughs> so, so think about happiness in small steps, little choices that you make every single day can make all the difference in the world about how you are as a person, how centered you are and how happy you are with, with your, yourself. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. That, that's great advice. I yeah. love that. Thank you. I'll, I'll think of that every morning when I wake up. Most of the time I feel that way. <laughs> Me too, but it is a choice. Yeah, no, there's no question. Okay, I'm going to get into some questions here. Okay, cool. So Gloria um, goes to the University of San Francisco. She asks, what do you love most about your job and what is a project that you worked on that you felt was the most impactful? And we have to go kind of rapid fire. Yeah, on these cool. Um, I built, we built three recording studios at Converse called Converse Rubber Tracks. We opened them up for unsigned artists to record for free uh, to allow them to get their demo recorded. Uh, we recorded with over 3,000 artists over five years. We, we did mobile studios, pop-up studios all over the world. And um, to have played a role in over 3,000 artists being able to express themselves is the most meaningful thing I've ever done in my life. And I continue to, for my quest to figure out what's next at that level. That was like incredible. That's awesome. And, and the, when you established that and when Converse authorized you establishing that, what would you say that the goal was for Converse? In well, the goal was to uh, connect deeply with our core consumer and our core consumer was a musician, was a, was a street artist. And, you know, again, you serve your consumers. We asked these young musicians, what could we do to help you? They're like, man, I, I don't have a place to rehearse. I don't have a place to record. I can't afford to record. And I was like, okay, well, Nike sponsors soccer tournaments. Like, this is just like a soccer tournament, only it looks like studio. Yeah. So, let's, so we built that and we told artists every day, we're, hey, look, we're totally marketing to you. Like, I'm just not advertising to you, but I want you to like my brand. And I want you to like it because I did something nice for you. And massive impact for the brand, massive. Still to this day, I get stopped from time to time by musicians who said, I don't know if you know this, but I recorded in your studio many years ago. And I want to say thank you. And I'm always like, oh my God, that's crazy. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. So Carson from Kansas City, University of Kansas says, it's con continuously stated that content is king for the streaming services entertainment industry. How do you see marketers adapting to the oversaturation of content and consumer choice in yeah. that in the space during these streaming wars? Yeah, just because everyone's it's like marketing is the uh, the <laughs> marketing is one of the worst industries in the world of somebody does something and then everybody copies it. So one day, many years ago, someone said branded content is the thing. And man, did we everybody chased it. And now there is so much content on YouTube that no one ever watches. <laughs> So I think before you start that kind of stuff, you need to figure out if the stuff that you're making is what people want to see. No one gets up in the, in the morning and thinks to themselves as they're stretching in bed. I wonder if Sprite has a new YouTube video today. Like 
That's just not. But we at Sprite are like, we have a video. We put a video out in the world. And then we wonder why no one watched it. It's because no one cares. So you have to be super, super careful with that, I think. Okay. So Jane asks, do you think, do you think COVID change, changes where you have to be located in order to work in marketing? Or where do you think is the marketing hub? Um, I think that COVID is, you know, the obvious is it's changed everything. We've learned how to work remotely this past year. We're not in offices. Um, we're on Zoom calls all day long and we're still getting things done. Um, you know, I would argue that I'm working harder or was working harder uh, on Zoom calls all day than I was at the office because there's no, there was no downtime. But, um, so I don't think, I think that the idea of the office as a hub is still really important because of the human interaction and the stuff that happens between meetings. Like some of the best things in work happen not in the meeting, but between them. Yeah. So it's important, but I think that the concept of the office is going to change is more of a drop in versus a, I'm going to my office every single day kind of a thing. That's, that's what I think is going to happen. Certainly it's happening at some of the big, big companies that I've, I've worked at. I know that. If you're really ambitious um, and you want to be a marketer or advertiser in the uh, entertainment industry, do you think that you have to be in either Los Angeles or New York City? No. Um, I mean, I think it makes it easier uh, because the industries are based there and there's so there's such a, um, you know, a, a consult, you know, a group of people, a mass of people that are in that business. Yeah. I mean, New York and LA are certainly the entertainment capitals, but I would tell you that Atlanta is like, don't sleep on Atlanta. Because like the movies, music, I mean, this is the center of R&B and hip hop music, period. And there is the great stuff coming out of the coast, no question. But this city right now is on fire with, um, with incredibly creative people that are coming out of, this, co coming out of the COVID the pandemic. You're going to see a real surge from, the, from this city. So I think, you know, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't, you don't have to be, it helps, I think. But it really comes down to if you're a creative and you're making something, it's, you know, what, what do you have to say? It doesn't matter where, where that comes from as long as it's something meaningful. Good. Nadine um, asked, you talked about the issue of silos. To a, budding, to a budding marketer, what advice do you have for working across team teams toward integrated marketing solutions, even if the company isn't set up that way? Yeah, I mean, I, I think... I think you just have to fight for the consumer. You know, it's like, it, again, it's organizations are built. We're going to build an integrated marketing organization. I mean, it's to run one, right? And you're like, yeah, that's amazing. And, but like, if you're not thinking about the consumer, it doesn't matter what you call your team. Yeah. Like you got to get everybody on the same page about like, what are we doing here? Who are the people that we're talking to? How are we trying to connect with them? What are we, what are we doing here? Why are we here? We call consumers targets. You know what targets are? You shoot bows and arrows, bow and arrows and guns at targets. Yeah. They're people. So like, you know, understand that. And yeah, you have to coordinate because the consumer sees everything you do. They see it and they see your consistencies. And more importantly, they see your inconsistencies. They see the, the gaps between the silos at the company in the marketing that comes out. They're like, oh, that doesn't make any sense doesn't make any sense because they don't have their shit together <laughs> so yeah good stuff um when they um an anonymous attendee actually says what's the best way to ask for help um i don't think there is a best way just ask i mean you know reach out to people use your network you know, it's always good to find somebody that knows somebody. It's like, you know, it's like, you know, you, everyone knows somebody who knows somebody in the music business. <laughs> like, you, you, yeah. Use those relationships to establish at least contact and then ask for help. And, you know, nine out of 10 people may say no, but, but that one that says yes might be able to really make a difference in your life. Well, and then Connie asks, what are some practices you do to stay creative during these times when you're locked in? We're all locked in like this. Oh, that's such a good question. Um, so I don't read the trades. I don't read. I know I, I was brand week marketer of the year and all that. And I, I read that one because my picture was on the cover and it was, I, you know, whatever. But I don't read those things because like it, it, it clouds my mind. Interesting. Uh, 
it just, it clouds my mind with what other people are doing. And I've always been the marketer that says, I really don't care what other people are doing. It's like, like this magazine company that I just started. Like these two guys called me and they're like, we're going to launch a magazine. And I was like, a magazine? That's a really bad idea. Like magazines aren't cool. Like the world's digital. And then I thought, man, magazines aren't cool. Huh, magazines are totally cool <laughs> because everyone thinks they're not cool. There's a space. Yeah. over here where we can create something new and interesting and so that's what we did so staying creative is about you know it's always you you're not going to be able to make noise in the world if you're standing in the middle of a crowd so sometimes excuse yourself from the middle of the crowd and go stand in the quiet place and that's where the magic happens the magic happens not in the midst of the crowd the magic happens when you step outside of the crowd and you do something different. The greatest artists in the world that we all have loved in our lives, did, most of them did not start playing guitar or singing to become famous. They became, they did it because they loved it and they had something to say. And they like, you know, like think about Nirvana. Like everyone was like, what the hell, take a shower. Like, who are you, right? And then all of a sudden it was like, holy cow, what is going on over there? And then. It's because they stepped out of the crowd and wanted to say something different. So I think that's how you stay creative is you got to make sure you're looking around and you're like, am I in a crowd? Am I doing what everyone else is doing? If that's the case, you know, think about finding that quiet place metaphorically. Ah, uh, listen, God, there's so, Jeff, I knew that there would be gems, but I had no idea there'd be so many gems. Somebody else pointed that out uh, that the, one of the comments was so many gems in here. And, uh, you know, I always choose a snippet as yeah. kind of a little promo-ish kind of thing for my podcast. And I don't know how I'm going to snippetize this thing. One, well, you know, I had to get, I had to drop a lot of gems because Fred Armisen is your next guest. And I'm like, I'm like that, that. I'm like, I cannot keep up with that. <laughs> oh, oh man. Um, when you were talking about just one last comment I have, and then I'll, and then I'll let you go because it's noon, but I'll, I'll stay here. Okay. If, Great. If you do. Yeah. Great. And I'll stay here. Because if anybody has any questions about creative university and how to get involved, because there's lots of ways to get involved and creating a relationship and establishing a relationship because once we understand the authenticity and the passion you have and get to know you a little bit, then we can go to bat for you. And that's what this is ultimately about, about yeah. establishing that relationship, which can lead to your first opportunity. And it's, it's really thrilling that we've been just organically, organically being able to place so many students into great internships and even a permanent position. And I think a second permanent position is gonna be coming soon um, in really cool places. Yeah, that's really great. Cool. And that's because of the talent that's out there. And remember it's democratized access because a lot of people don't have the inside track. And so like, if, if you're participating here, you're already doing something that's, that can lead to some, some really cool stuff. Yeah. Um, can okay. I say something really quick about yeah. you? Like you are one of my all time favorite people. And I'll tell you why you're, first of all, you're one of the smartest people and you're one of the most well-educated people at some of the finest places in the world, <laughs> but you don't lead with that. Like you, you are a good human being that tries to do good things and you're doing a very good thing here. And that's one of the reasons why I'm such a huge fan of yours. So I'm always here to help you because you have always been there to help me. And I am where I am partially because of my experiences with you and so many other people in my career. So I just want to publicly like say, like, thank you <laughs> for what you've done for me. Oh, dude, listen, I mean, um, wow. I'm, yeah. I'm honored to be on the receiving end of those words. And I'm really, really deeply touched, really deeply touched. So <laughs> thanks, man. Yeah. We got to see each other now. Totally, dude. <laughs> We got to get out of this pandemic. I got to fly to Atlanta. The only time, and I travel a lot. The only time I've been to Atlanta was when we were negotiating that deal. That so was it. Come back. That place is still there, by the way. I live a mile from there. Uh, oh, that's yeah. we got to go back. Yeah. Okay. Are right. there any are, other questions? I'm happy. I'm happy to stick around. I've got time. Uh, that's awesome. Thank you for that. Um, God, I'm still touched. I'm, but so any questions that people have about for Jeff or for Creative University and how to get involved. There's so much information at the Creative University website, which is the spelling here. Let me let me share screen for a second again. So we see that handsome face up there. Oh my God. Um, 
but just really quickly again you see like there's so many sessions that we've had go to the youtube channel and fred armison as i said fred armison is a is going to be next saturday the 20th wow like that would be so cool bring your questions q a for fred i mean how many times you get that opportunity evan shapiro is a great guy and look at his his background among other things he was one of the creators of portlandia and he was the president of national lampoon and so many other things he also is a professor an adjunct professor at NYU Stern and at Fordham and does a lot of philanthropic things for young people. And he has a cool organization um, that he'll talk about too. You can check out all the, um, the Creative University sessions, like I said, on the YouTube channel. They're in podcast format on my Fearless Media podcast, which is on all platforms. So if you search Fearless Media, you'll find it. Jeff's interview will be up there in a, in a, in a few days. Um, but it will be on the YouTube channel earlier than that. I wrote a book during the pandemic about the media and entertainment business, and I'm making it available free to you guys. Um, there's an amazing three-part series by Anam Khan, who's probably on this call. She's a superstar creative university student, really alumnus now. Um, she got a, we were able to get to know her. She was actively involved. She, she showed up, she attended sessions. She was enthusiastic, she was proactive. She came up with ideas and she first got an internship and then she ultimately now has a full-time job at a great company called um, Bulldog Digital Media where she's the head of strategy and doing great things because I know the CEO and the CEO just raves about Unum. And she came to me and Creative University students out there, you have the opportunity to like, this is our platform, it's organic, but there is no one way of doing We are open to ideas. That's the point. We want to make it as helpful to you. So Anam came to me and said, how about this? How about like doing a series about um, the whole uh, interviewing and landing your first gig and all that? And I said, absolutely, go for it. And she created an amazing three-part series that's, that's available on our YouTube channel. And it's been viewed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. So it's obviously extremely useful. Part one's networking, part two's resumes, cover letters, part three is interviewing, really good stuff. Um, I, let me go back to see if there's any other questions. I'm looking at the chat. Jeff was amazing. So many people saying, Jeff, you were amazing. And Jeff, you were amazing. Thank and you. so nice to hear. I appreciate uh, that. How, Alexis says, how do I get involved? Alexis, go to the Creative University website and reach out to us. Show up at the these um, webinars, ask questions um, because it's a great opportunity. It's a rare opportunity, but also just reach out to us. You'll find our contact information and let's establish a relationship and we can tell you the different ways to get involved. We have a core group that's amazing that um, is doing really cool things. Uh, and by the way, as I said at the beginning, some of the students created the Creative University LinkedIn page. So that's live in color, fresh right now. And it also gives you an opportunity to meet each other directly without me being the middleman. So you guys can connect with each other and collaborate because you're, you're all creative, so much to give. Um, what do you do if, well, okay. So Jeff, I'm gonna ask you this one. An anonymous attendee says, what do you do if you have many interests and don't know what path to take? Oh, man, that's a great question. I think you're going to have to. Um, wow, that's a good question. I I, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, that's a good question. I mean, I, I'm interested in lots of different things. I think you just have to pick one. You're going to test some things. Um, you know, not everything you're passionate about needs to be your work. You know, there are some things you're passionate about that can just be things that, that keep you you, um, that keep you different from others and, and you know, might not be employment. You well, you know, for you, you, you took us on a journey from the time you were a kid where music was fundamental to your soul. Yeah, right? but I had no plan to do that. No, you had, no, but that's what I'm saying. You had no plan to do it, but lo and behold, yeah, it has been a steady stream throughout your career. So I think like whoever you are who asked the question, there's a million paths we can go, an infinite path, paths yeah. we can go. Some are going to be more fulfilling, some less fulfilling. Um, but what drives you? Music similarly has driven me. I know. And, and I feel so fortunate that like I've been able to build it into my career. And it's a it's incredible how how you can you can make things happen, people. You can reach out to people. I was yeah. telling Jeff, like you know, Fred Armisen, 
we're not, we're not friends, but I was able to tell him about the mission that we have for Creative University. And he jumped on board. Like, what a great guy. He does so many things. That's so and cool. Don't be afraid to reach out to people um, authentically. Yeah. Show your passion, you know, like, but people show up for you more than you would think. Yeah. Like, be right. bold. Be bold. That's my advice. Like, yeah. and when you're young, my God, there's no timetable here. There's no one right timetable. So people out there, don't feel like you have to land the perfect gig right out of school or don't punish yourself if right now you don't feel like you have the right things lined up or maybe even anything lined up. Yeah, right. Go back to the interview I did with Randy Commissar, who's a, a, a venture capitalist at one of the, the most blue chippiest venture capital firms. And it wasn't about money. He talks about like... Um, he talks about the pandemic and kind of how to think about it. Like there, there are no rules of the game. People will give you a hall pass right now. If you try things and experiment and it doesn't work out, they'll give you a pass on that because they understand like now is a moment in time to, to really go for it. Um, okay. And then one last question. Yeah. Uh, maybe two, if you have two, this I, got, will be the last two. I got nothing but time for you. Okay, the last two. How do you build a brand for yourself? Oh, oh, good question. I think, you know, um, I mean, you know, all the tools are available for you to do it. You know, what you project into the world becomes who you are as a brand. Um, you know, I think, you know, one thing about social media and one bit of advice is that, you know, be, you know, I know people are choiceful and careful what they post, but, you know, a lot of companies will like do a scan of your social media before they hire you. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, you got to just be, be aware of that. But I mean, I think building a personal brand is, is you being you, you being authentic, finding ways to show your point of view. Like, I mean, I have been fortunate. I guess I've built my name over the years. You know, I got, Fast Company called me two weeks ago and asked me to write a piece about the Super Bowl. I don't, I don't know anybody at Fast Company. I was like, that's amazing. But but I did it because I wanted to also evolve what people think of what I'm capable of doing. So I think it's just a, it's a constant every day. Again, who do I want to be? What am I going to be today? You build a brand day by day by day. Like it's not an event. It's, a, it's an ongoing consistency in who you are and how you communicate and how you show up and how you project yourself. Yeah, and reflect your, don't be afraid to reflect your indiv individuality. Of course. Don't feel like you have to milk everything down, you know? No, to, not at all. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's good Good advice also, be careful of your social media posts. That's I mean, I, I once wrote a, uh, I, uh, McDonald's uh, ran a campaign in Europe and they ran, in the campaign, there was a bunch of street art that was in the campaign. And um, the street artists, in Europe were like, hey, that's my art. Um, you didn't ask permission. Uh, like, and so um, they got a lawyer and um, at the time um, they didn't, the corporation didn't wanna pay the artists. And um, so some of these artists were my friends. So it was a Friday afternoon, I was sitting in my living room in Boston and I wrote a scathing piece. And I posted it on my Facebook page and it was, it had bad language in it. And I mean, the points were all the right points, but like it was not handled the best way. And it was within 20 minutes, it was all over the internet, like everywhere. And I had to kind of walk it back a little bit because of the, so you just gotta be super careful. Um, you know, and now, you know, now you can't find it. It's been buried. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay. Last question. Last question. Cause I got to let you go. Have by Carson, have you ever had to compromise with a project decision or company? You talked about how it was hard to take no's from P and G. How do you deal with, with it when you have your, I guess your strong beliefs and you're put in a position where they expect you to compromise? Yeah, I think you got to pick your battles there, right? So when I interviewed at Nike uh, many years ago, the former head of marketing is this old kind of like Jedi mind trick dude. And he asked me a question in the interview. He literally said, I know everything there is to know about you already. I'm not going to ask you any questions. I just want to ask you one question. Have you ever gone all the way? And I thought, well, that's a super odd question to ask. Like what? That's what? And he goes, I mean, have you ever... You know what I mean? 
Have you ever gone all the way? Have you ever believed in something so much that you were willing to put it all on the line? And at that moment, I was like, oh, my God, I haven't. Oh, shit. Like, oh, my God, I have never. And I was ashamed of myself that I had never believed in something so much that I was willing to put it on the line. So a couple years later, the studio idea came up. I was told no a hundred times and I went all the way. And because I believed in it so much in my heart because it was the right thing to do. So sometimes you gotta like, you gotta go all the way. Now, the, not all the time, not over everything, but you pick those battles. And then on the little things, you know, life is about compromise. And your idea may be the best idea to you, but it may not be the best idea to the rest of the people in the room. So the power of knowledge comes from the room, from understanding how to draw that knowledge and power out of the room, around the table, into something bigger. It's less about compromise and more about listening and interacting and making sure that like you're communicating clearly and also understanding that your idea might not be the best idea on the table. And sometimes like that's hard to admit you would, might look at that as compromise. I would look at that as you contributed to building an idea. Like it's not about compromise, it's about finding the right solution. So, um, you know, compromise is a word people use and it's a bad thing. Like, oh, I had to compromise. Like, it's not, it's not. Like when you and I negotiated that giant deal with Universal and Coke many, many years ago, like we had to, comp both of us had to compromise on certain things. And like we lived and it was all good. And it was like, the things we compromised on were like, you needed some things and I needed some things and we, we found ways to compromise and work them out. And like, here we are 20 years later, still, still talking to one another. We didn't feel like, well, gosh, I had to compromise. I hate that person. Yeah. So, yeah. so compromise isn't a bad thing, always. No, it's, and it, 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 you just, you brought it back to such a, like I said, a magical time in my career that that whole experience was magical and music was, because it's so we're so passionate about it of course music was there but yeah it's not like we've seen each other much during the last 20 some years but we've every now and then we drop each other a line and here you are showing up for everybody out there and jeff you're a great guy so many gems so many nuggets from this uh, means a lot and you've done great things congratulations on everything that you've done throughout your career and staying authentic to you and really like innovating all along the way too so thank, thank you, you. Thank, Thank you, Jeff Cottrell, for showing up. Um, the audience certainly loved it. And I'll make this available uh, on demand too, and, and it will certainly make it, make the rounds. Well, great. Well, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm honored to have been a part of this, so I, I appreciate being asked. I'm grateful for you asking me. Great to see you, Jeff. All right, see everyone yeah. later. Yeah. Bye. Do my best. See you, you too.